Okay, good morning, everyone. Evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. It's wonderful to be here today. My name is Cecilia Sorensen. I'm the director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education. And we're here today for a member webinar. And we have some very exciting uh, presenters today who are going to be telling us about their programs. We have Dr. Purnima, Purnima Prabhakaran from the Public Health Foundation of India, who will be presenting with Ruth Dermot Levy from Villanova. And this presentation will be followed by Dr. Adesh Sundarisan um, from the University College of London. So thank you all so much for joining us and we look forward to your presentations. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Purnima. Thank you, Cecilia. I'll just share my screen there. You can see my screen now, right? Yeah, okay. So um, thank you again, Cecilia, and thank you to the uh, Global Consortium in Climate and Health Education for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Punima Prabhakaran, and I bring greetings to you all from the Center for Environmental Health at the Public Health Foundation of India. Um, I'm going to be actually doing a duet with Professor Ruth McDermott on this. Uh, I will first walk you through some of the education initiatives that we have at PHFI, and I will then turn it over to Ruth uh, to share um, um, uh, glimpses from the collaborative venture that we had with her uh, earlier this year. Um, so to start us off, uh, I don't think uh, I need to say this, why are we talking about climate change, but just for the benefit of other listeners from around the world who are just um, tuning in to listen on what we are all working on. It is the biggest public health challenge of the 21st century, but it is also the biggest public health opportunity of the 21st century. And no doubt as uh, people working with the health sector, I think we have a big role here in adapting and responding to the acute climatic events and the impacts on health. And a big part of this also involves education and enhancing awareness of the health sector actors on climate change. So talking about the climate and health education initiatives at the Public Health Foundation of India, uh, this organization is about 15 years old. We have a mandate of uh, building a cadre of public health professionals in India. Uh, besides doing, uh, uh, conducting a lot of research, we also have a huge uh, mandate for capacity building in India. And uh, much of that centers now around climate change and health, given it's such a topical issue of relevance. And I've listed here what we do in uh, PHFI. We uh, teach climate change and health uh, courses through a variety of uh, formats. We have graduate courses in public health. We also engage with health professionals. And when I say health professionals, that includes doctors, nurses, and hospital administrators. We also engage with students, which again includes you know, students from the medical fraternity, dental students, nursing students, um, and of course, the public health students that I already mentioned, which therefore you know, brings together the entire fraternity of um, health actors of the future. We also engage with the government, with the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in particular, uh, besides providing technical inputs to the government on various national as well as subnational programs, including their program on climate change. We've ventured, I think, in a timely manner also into e-courses, given the pandemic situation that became all the more relevant. Uh, so I will talk about two initiatives on the e-courses uh, format, one which was a project that was commissioned to us from the WHO regional office, the Southeast Asia regional office. And then um, Ruth will talk about the international ecos that we delivered together with other partners, actually. She will share um, uh, the nuggets from that initiative as well. So let me walk you through what we did in each of those programs. So talking about the graduate programs at Public Health Foundation of India, PHFI has a mandate to establish Indian Institutes of Public Health, and we have about six campuses across India. And we run the Masters, of, uh, masters in Public Health programs at these campuses, and they are generally uh, two-year programs. Uh, we have about 40 students that enroll every year on an average, and the, uh, the course includes core subjects as well as thematic areas. 
So ranging from the basic epidemiology and biostatistics to uh, health economics, nutrition, social determinants of health. And within that two year, uh, two year course, we at the Center for Environmental Health have integrated an environmental and occupational health module. So the first year includes a six week module, which is an introductory module on environmental uh, issues and, as, um, and the health uh, burdens related to those environmental risk factors. And a second module, which is the environmental and occupational health module two in the second year of the MPH program. So filtering that down to what we do for climate change education. So in the EOH one module, we do three courses. One is an introductory course to climate change. The second is impacts of climate change on human health. And we introduce the students in, the, in this introductory module also to the concept of climate smart health systems. In the second EOH module, the module two, uh, we get into a little more uh, detail uh, from the climate change lens. We talk about climate change and urban resilience in India. We usually have a guest lecture coming in here from the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. And so he talks to our students about um, the programmatic aspect, the policies, as well as the lessons learned in India on urban resilience in response to climate change events. Uh, we also have our faculty member, Dr. Richa Sharma, who talks to the students about urban heat and microclimate um, uh, in cities, the related health impacts. Uh, and we've introduced uh, uh, from last year, uh, uh, given the relevance during the pandemic, climate change and changing disease trends. We talk about zoonotic diseases, COVID-19, and uh, the links to climate change. So the courses, the EOH module actually uh, brings the students uh, three credits each and uh, that is integrated into their MPH credits. And at the end of the day, we also have students who, at the end of the two years, do thesis, um, uh, thesis uh, uh, you know, programs, um, uh, research, uh, two month or three month small project on research. And many times we have people coming to us showing interest in climate change and health impacts. So I, I think we are kind of um, stimulating that interest in climate change. And, and it's heartening to note that more and more students are interested in the domain of environmental health and in particular climate change. Um, in terms of engaging health professionals, we have a network of uh, hospitals and health professionals in the private health system in India. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the health system in India, we have a very diverse health system. We have the public health system as well as the private health system. And in the private health system, there are individual hospitals, networks of hospitals, smaller nursing homes, and a clinical establishment. So we engage these health professionals, as in the doctors, the nurses, and the hospital administrators through regular webinars on environmental health issues. And we often talk about climate change. We have a specific climate smart healthcare webinar series as well. And we have been uh, doing this at least once in two months. We talk to them on a variety of issues, sometimes bring in guest lecturers. Uh, we talk about everything from the siting of health facilities based on geohazards. We talk about resource efficiency in terms of energy efficiency in healthcare sustainable procurement for healthcare. We talk about climate sensitive diseases and how the health sector needs to adapt to um, changing disease burden as it relates to acute climatic events. So this is a very popular webinar series that we do. We also engage with our busy health professionals to newsletters. Sometimes they're not able to attend the webinar. So we have a regular newsletter, it's called Green Circle uh, with a lot of educative resources on um, climate and health. Uh, we uh, direct them also to conferences, other workshops, um, and, and other educative resources around climate change and health. So that keeps them up to speed on, on the issue. Um, we are working also with the necessary uh, you know, um, powers that be to include climate change and health in medical curricula. This is something that we are very interested in, uh, in doing. We need to bring about that change Currently, we don't even have an issue like air pollution in our medical curriculum. So, you know, very related topics, climate change and air pollution, to bring that into not just medical curricula, but also nursing and allied health sciences curricula in India. We have targeted engagement occasionally with medical and nursing students. They are members of our private hospital network, the Nursing Students Association, the Medical Students Association. And sometimes on a needs-based basis, sometimes they reach out to us when they have conferences and want to learn more about climate change. So that's interesting as well, that there is an appetite for learning about climate change and health. Um, so we've had a fairly good experience uh, with the 
growing interest, I would say, with the medical as well as the nursing students. Um, I'll move on now to talk about a little bit about our work with the Ministry of Health. And I'm doing that because it also involves some training around climate change and health. So um, in India, uh, the Prime Minister's Council for Climate Change was established in 2015. Uh, in 2008, actually, and it was only in 2015 that they included a health focus in the in the program. And so the National Health Mission was established, and within that, the National Program for Climate Change and Human Health. And what this program was supposed to do is to bring together an implementation framework at the national level for adapting to climate change, the increased disease burden that we see coming uh, in the in the future as well as prepare our health systems to deal with the increasing disease burden, but also be responsive uh, to you know, reducing their own carbon footprint. So this implementation framework for the National Action Plan on Climate Change and Human Health will be disseminated across all the 28 states and the eight union territories across the country. And uh, PHFI is recognized as a center of excellence under this program. And we contribute to this framework uh, from the lens of building green and climate resilient health systems. There are 17 other centers of excellence which contribute to this program. And all of us are involved in training all cadres of health officials in the public health system. So I talked earlier about how we engage with the private hospitals and doctors and nurses in the private health system, but through working with the Ministry of Health in the Government of India and their national program for climate change and human health, we've had the good fortune of engaging across the country with all the health actors at different levels of the public health system, down to, you know, the primary health care centers, the community health centers, as well as the district and sub-district hospitals. So when we conduct our training programs on climate change and health, uh, all of these people are um, attending the program and learning about the different aspects of climate change and health. And um, our training from PHFI is particularly on climate smart health care, which has two pillars, both climate adaptation as well as climate mitigation. And uh, in the last couple of years, these uh, webinars and teaching programs are attended virtually by about 300 health sector representatives. I'll move on next to the e-courses on climate change and health. As I mentioned before, the WHO, the regional office for the Southeast Asia region, which is located in New Delhi, had commissioned uh, PHFI to develop an e-course on climate change and health. And, um, this e-course was supposed to be targeted at a very diverse audience. They wanted this e-course not just for their own WHO officials. There's a lot of turnover in the WHO uh, employee base. So they wanted people within WHO, but also have this WHO resource for people in the CRO region, uh, for health, uh, health professionals or people working in the policy space, as well as students. So they wanted us to develop the self-paced short course on climate change and health. So basically what these courses include are short PowerPoint presentations, and we did them with voiceover. And uh, we included case studies. We included a lot of reading resources. And, um, and they're basically self-paced, about 20-minute courses, which people can do at their own pace, tailored for a diverse audience, as I already mentioned. And it is hopefully going to be an open source resource, which will be hosted on WHO Geneva's OpenAQ platform. And when it's open on the OpenAQ platform, it also becomes available to uh, people in every other WHO region. We, as we all know, there are six WHO regions and people could access this course even from a mobile platform. Uh, so we had to stick to those criteria of what it takes to develop um, open AQ kind of uh, conducive e-course. Um, and I'll uh, walk you through the five courses that we developed under this e-course, five modules, as we call them. Uh, there's one on climate change and vulnerability risk assessments, uh, one on health national adaptation plans, the health HNAPs, the country level um, uh, mandate is to develop a health national adaptation plan at every uh, country. We have one on climate change and water safety planning. Then there is the integrated disease surveillance and early warning systems module. And lastly, uh, the climate resilient and environmentally sustainable health systems. 
So this e-course, we're just wrapping this work up. And I, I think today we're actually turning it over back to the CRO uh, office and it will be shortly uh, available on their website, but soon hopefully on the WHO OpenAQ platform. So we're really excited about this because this is going to be a resource. The CRO WHO region has 11 countries, which includes uh, apart from India, we have Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, uh, Sri Lanka, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, and South Korea. So really many vulnerable regions and Maldives. So uh, we're really excited about this and hopefully it will be a good resource for people in these countries. Um, and I think that's it from me, really. I think that's a snapshot of what we do in terms of our initiatives for climate and climate change and health education in PHFI. And I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, uh, Professor Ruth McDermott, to talk about the other e-course that we uh, did as a collaborative venture. Uh, so I'll stop sharing my screen there, Ruth, and you can yeah, take it from here. Thank you so much. Hi, Ruth, I think you're muted. I think you're muted. That's a problem. Okay, thank you so much, Pranima. I'm gonna talk about the course that um, PHFI, the um, Center for Environmental Health, and my university, Villanova University, participated in, as well as um, two other uh, universities, the University of Eastern Finland and the University of Calabar in Nigeria. So we have four continents here four different institutions and four different academic structures. So um, there were some challenges with that, but, but we persevered. Um, I also wanna say that the, the, this came out of, um, or working with these institutions came out of um, looking at the list on um, the Global Consortium for Climate and Health Education and what universities were out there. And, um, and the idea of a combined course came from a discussion with um, someone at PHFI and myself of um, thinking about how we can um, engage students more. So um, it, it's probably started in uh, 2018 and here we are. So we've, we've run the course two times and we're gonna run it again this spring. So um, what we've done, it's known as the Collaborative Online International Learning. Uh, we just, I just learned that term actually. We didn't know that that's what we were doing. But um, it actually, I looked it up and it is in, um, in the literature, primarily the nursing literature. Um, there is something in a, in a medical journal about it and a dental journal, but nursing has um, really uh, grabbed onto this. And what um, COIL is, is um, when more than one, uh, you know, two or more schools in two different um, countries participate in online learning, when it's shared, you know, develop course development, and then this um, shared teaching, and that's certainly what we've done. And then the opportunity for students to engage, to increase their global perspective. And, and we um, surely have done that. The four schools that are involved, we have um, public health from PHFI, we have nursing from Villanova, and then um, University of Eastern Finland is also nursing. And then the University of Calabar is a school of medicine. So we have medicine, public health, and nursing. Um, and in the class, we also have students who um, study nutrition. And um, I believe we had a dental student as well. So we are um, really expanding to um, capture all the different um, uh, uh, disciplines within healthcare, as Pornima said that, that how important that is. Um, when you do this type of course, um, we're, we're all kind of learning as we've gone on, like, well, this is a great idea, now how do we implement it? And this is what um, my kind of thoughts and what I've learned from um, this experience is, you really need to have committed faculty that are willing to go that extra mile. And, and we are really fortunate to have um, those, those faculty um, from all of our institutions that will um, kind of keep pushing things because um, it is challenging to get um, we have to get a memorandum of understanding and to move all that forward. Um, so those kind of extra things to teaching a course really needs to be um, involved. We've had many planning meetings. Uh, we met yesterday. Uh, so, and we do for those of you um, in the United, United States or in, you know, my, I'm in uh, 
uh, the mid-Atlantic region of the United States to the East Coast. So it's, I think it's probably eight o'clock in the morning right now. But we, um, we, we typically, uh, on my time, we have to meet very early, but on Pornitima's time, it's at the end of the day. So again, you know, it's that commitment of um, being willing to do that. Those in Africa and Europe are able to meet um, during their working hours. Um, there is also an issue to consider about intellectual property because we are sharing our materials um, with one another. Um, what we have, we had a discussion very early on about this. Um, we have decided that we are willing to share this because this is so important and we're willing to share our syllabus and things with, with others as well. So um, we'll have to get that to you, Cecilia, to share that um, with you all. And then what we've also uh, learned is there needs to be, within this group, there needs to be a leader to, again, organize things. And, and so there needs to be some sort of infrastructure to be able to um, move this forward. And we have done that, um, but it's things to think about that we've learned as we've gone on. We also need an online platform that is open across the institutions. And that uh, was uh, actually probably our first challenge. Um, I met with our IT department and um, I was very forceful. <laughs> I came in and said, this is what we're gonna do now, help me do it. And I didn't say, uh, you know, I wasn't really nice about it. I'm like, this needs to be done, so let's do it. And um, they met me in that. And so we have found an online platform that is able to um, pass through our firewalls and be access to everyone else. Um, so that's how we've decided to do it is have one institution hold it. Um, the other thing with four different institutions, we have four different ways that tuition is paid. Um, and so that's why we wanted something that could um, go past um, you know, the institution that holds the, the website um, so that um, PHFI can do their way that they pay tuition, um, Nigeria can do theirs, Finland, and then the US, you know, we all can do um, their own way. And, uh, you know, a lot of schools don't want to lose that tuition and, the, and they need that. So we needed to recognize that. So um, the, the platform we have uses more of a social media approach. So it's not your typical um, learning platform in that respect where you can, you know, put files where students can come back to later. So we had to create that within uh, the platform. I'll share with you later if you want to know the name of the platform. I just didn't want to do an advertisement here. Um, but what this has done is, um, so it is definitely worth the effort, I believe. Um, it's really allowed experts from each country, and you can hear Pornima's expertise and, and all her connections with um, WHO, um, and we have uh, um, our faculty in Nigeria's expert in air quality. So we have experts from around the world being able to teach within their area of expertise um, to the students. So they really benefit. And I believe we, as faculty, we've all benefited from that as well. Um, and so uh, we, we have done it, um, it's asynchronous. And so students, you know, have online discussions and videos and recorded lectures that they listen to. Um, weekly, uh, we have weekly modules, and then it has culminated in an online um, live Zoom um, session with students presenting on topics related to climate change because they work within groups and the groups are, um, you know, mixed up by country. So we'll have students from the US, Nigeria, Finland, and India in the same group. So they get to know each other and, and hear about the challenges related to climate change in their own country. Uh, this is the uh, online, uh, the, the last class from uh, last year. Actually, there's Pornima right there, and there's me. But um, there, the students, um, this was, they were listening to the presentations, and this was the last part. They actually, they all, um, it was kind of a love fest at the end. They were, they all really got to know each other, and um, they, they asked that we take a picture. So um, we got a picture, that's my computer screen. But um, there's, here's just comments from the students of very positive experiences. We did do um, an evaluation um, at the end. And what we, one of the things that we did hear from students is they would like to have some more live sessions. So we're gonna incorporate that this spring, have three additional live sessions in addition to uh, the seminar. And, and so um, the way we're gonna do that for faculty is, that there'll be two faculty on each live session. So we'll rotate through. And I'm actually lo really looking forward to that, to really hear what the students are thinking and, and again, give them opportunity to engage. 
And so that um, is our course. Um, and I will be happy to share anything or answer any questions. And here is our email addresses if you want, want um, any contact information. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth and Purnima. This is so exciting. These collaborations that you've created are, are mind blowing. I mean, it's incredible that you've been able to sort of work across oceans and get students together. And I, I can just imagine students being able to talk to each other across the world and, and just be able to start understanding what each other are dealing with on a totally different level that is usually so inaccessible. So thank you for all the work you're doing. It's just fantastic. Um, so let's hold off on questions till the end. Um, I'll turn it over to Adesh right now and please hold your questions. You can put them in the chat if you like, but um, let's, let's get through the next one and then we'll have a discussion. Thank you, Cecilia. And thank you, Purnima and Ruth. It was fantastic to hear about the programs that you guys have been spearheading um, on different parts of the world. I'll just quickly share my screen, if that's okay. Are you able to see that? Does that? Are you able to see the presentation? Okay, fantastic. Um, so yeah, as I said, thank you for having me. It's a real honor and pleasure to be um, speaking on this uh, platform today to all of you. And I think uh, I won't sort of uh, digress and repeat uh, what Purnam and Ruth went through at the beginning, but we all understand this is a, um, an emergency and that professionals from various disciplines are required um, to act on a, as a matter of urgency uh, to tackle, as we've described, the greatest uh, threat to our health, but also the greatest opportunity um, over the 21st century. Um, what I'll cover today um, briefly, I think my presentation will be slightly shorter um, than the combined one, uh, so I hope that's okay. Just a quick background into the climate education uh, scenario in the UK, across UK medical schools. Uh, talk a little bit about the course that we set up in the last year at UCL Medical School, um, the feedback from the students and sort of where we aim to go uh, from there going forwards. So there are 37 medical schools in the UK and we all have very unique curriculums across the different medical schools, although they're bound by this TMC curriculum to so the General Medical Council. So they provide a list of sort of competencies of what they expect uh, graduate doctors uh, to be uh, aware of or able to do when they enter their residency or as a junior doctors as well. So the GMC actually, I'll just skip a few slides here as you can see. So they actually in 2018 finally recognized the importance of uh, newly qualified doctors having some, some idea of what, what environmental health means uh, and delineating that in their list of um, core competencies for, for doctors. So it's actually relatively new in terms of how uh, pressing or urgent it's been um, showcased across UK medical schools. And um, we also have had the planetary health report card. I'm sure many of you guys are, are aware of that as well. So that's sort of taken off in the last 12 months or so with a lot of participation from UK medical schools. There's a lot of drive and it seems to have put pressure on uh, medical schools and uh, faculty to embed and in start incorporating climate health and sustainability education, uh, both vertically and horizontally into medical curriculums. And obviously, um, there are the GCCHE uh, core competencies, which are fantastic, which I definitely referred to and were very useful to help structuring um, the course that I set up at UCL. So I'll briefly kind of describe what the main issues are. As, you, as I'm sure many, all of you are aware, medical curriculums and nursing curriculums for that respect are packed. So they're sort of six, five or six years, which are absolutely um, packed together. And it's really difficult to add uh, anything into those curriculums without removing something else, which has already been sort of uh, deemed a priority for medical students' education. So, uh, you know, one of the ways to do it is to offer a standalone module or a student selected component on the side as an extra course for students. Um, the other drive is to embed the content across the curriculum. And then there's obviously asynchronous uh, student self-directed learning versus synchronous or live materials as well. So UCL was very open to uh, a combination of these, but as a matter of urgency, the easiest thing to set up, um, which would take the least amount of time uh, in the first year was the student selected component or a standalone module. So I was asked to develop a course for first year medical students as sort of a trial for the rest of the medical school to see how it would um, sort of, whether there'd be a domino effect and a good uptake by, by clinical students as well. Um, and it was one of the first of its kind in the UK. We actually had a uh, planetary health report card meeting of all the different medical schools, about 33 medical schools in the UK and all their senior faculty who gathered on a Zoom call last week. And it was actually really surprising and fantastic to see um, just how many medical schools are actually beginning to try and set these modules up. 
uh, in the last 12 to 24 months. And actually having heard Purnima and Ruth as well, there's a lot of homogeneity between modules and similarities in different parts of the world, um, despite the fact that several of the medical schools in the UK haven't collaborated or had any sort of um, communication before. So as we all know, WHO also placed a great importance to doctors who are able to uh, be adaptable, uh, resilient in the face of a changing uh, climate for what not of a, a better way to articulate that and as in this changing situation. And the UCL doctor as well um, places an importance on an adaptable medical practitioner who's able to uh, change their practice uh, in a world that's in sort of in a constant state of flux as well. And we talked about the GMC. So having a student select a component, UCL has sort of two, uh, two terms in which they offer these. So I was offered one slot in which I had eight weeks uh, and three hours every week, which is quite a short uh, periods of learning to kind of combine different disciplines across climate health and sustainability so really when I look back my main goal was the main word that I had in the top of my head was empowerment so I wanted these students to sort of go away and have some sort of skill or ability that would able uh, that would allow them to participate in projects down the line so I didn't want it to be just a didactic standalone you go away and learn about it but how can they then make the leap and participate in other projects, courses, um, organizations, um, and be useful down the line as well. So the course that I set up was a blend. It was a mix of seminars, small group work. We had uh, live discussions as well, Q&A. And they also had private study and reading to do, uh, to slot in uh, between the sessions as well. There was also an assessment at the end, which was a presentation and a written submission, which I'll show you some examples of in a minute. So these are sort of roughly the main areas which we covered. So the first is sort of a generic intro into climate science, um, which obviously they need in terms of that core understanding um, from meteorological perspective uh, as well to get them started, climate and health drivers and interactions as well. Adaptation, so that includes um, country specific adaptation. So in our case, the NHS has planned a huge net zero initiative going forward. So we aim to be carbon uh, net zero as a health service by 2040 and sort of the wider scope by 2045 as well. So there's a lot of change in the way junior doctors and, and trainees are gonna be practicing over the next 20 years. So it's giving them an understanding of that as well. And also how to communicate and how to be advocates because medical professionals, uh, healthcare professionals are highly respected individuals. And it's about trying to train them up that they do have this voice and how are we best going to get across our arguments um, to inform and change policy as well on a higher level. So we were very fortunate to also have a range of expert speakers. You can see uh, Dr. Sorensen was one of the uh, very kind participants in this course as well. And uh, as you can see, very similar to what, what Ruth was saying before, we had speakers from all across the world who were experts in their individual disciplines. So we had uh, Professor Joachim Roklov, who's an infectious disease uh, expert uh, from Sweden. We had a range of uh, experts from around the world in their disciplines that also uh, enabled sort of a live question answer session within every session uh, within each week which I think the students found fantastic so that was one of the pros of having it asynchronous learning and having a live sort of Q&A in which they could sort of ask um, individual questions to the experts and I think they, they actually particularly really enjoyed the session with uh, with Cecilia um, on, on women and the impact um, of climate on their health across the world. So in terms of the assessment uh, and what skills they really took from the whole of the course, well, we wanted them to be able to um, access uh, evidence as well. As this is a growing field, the evidence is, has been scarce over the last 10 years. It's a very, very rapidly growing uh, evidence base as well. And we wanted the students to kind of have an idea of where they could access data, where they could access evidence as well, and how to put it together and how to sort of formulate their ideas. So it's about sort of you take it from the top level, students are aware that X causes Y or can cause a multitude of, uh, you know, um, knock on health effects, X climate driver, and sort of uh, situate, situate, putting this into their own locality or their own experiences. What is affecting them? What is affecting the UCL community? What is affecting people living in London? Um, and also formulating their thoughts, putting that into a coherent argument as well. And so we had them doing both presentations and written assessments. So we had some really interesting um, pieces actually. So uh, someone was investigating the uh, effect of climate change and the health of the uh, Nunavut uh, population in the Arctic. We also had people looking at the uh, vulnerabilities of women in the Alaga community. 
And we had people looking at uh, food and how that affects uh, health, uh, climate and health impacts down the line as well, looking at co-benefits. So we had a range of uh, fantastic assignments submitted and this was all over just eight weeks uh, from students knowing actually almost nothing about the basics of climate change itself to going through to understanding how that affects health and how they can also be advocates uh, for change. We had fantastic uh, feedback from the students as well. So the great part was that the majority, it was a small number. So the end number we had was small. We only had about um, seven students on the course, which is a really small end number. But when you're asking uh, student medical students to sign up with a range of other 20 other SSCs that they feel might be more of a priority on cardiology or neurosurgery, which they feel it might be more um, in line with their career ambitions going down. It was sort of a hard sell initially, but we had a fantastic uh, response from the students and the majority, as you can see, found it not only enjoyable, but um, felt empowered to that they had enough knowledge to go forward and take part in uh, climate and health as a field as well. I think the biggest challenge was, was uptake. So as I was saying, when with, for any standalone module, we found that selling it to students uh, as a standalone was quite difficult uh, when they had limited uh, other options as well. Adding content to the PAC curriculum. So something we're doing at UCL this year is looking to embed sustainability and climate change um, vertically across all years. So that includes clinical and preclinical medicine. So as Purnima mentioned, the scope is endless. So if you take even respiratory health or cardio, you know, cardiovascular health at the beginning, it's just even if those points are embedded into the curricula, in learning outcomes, aware that air pollution causes X and Y detrimental effects on respiratory health in the short term and in the long term, and similarly for cardiovascular medicine as well. So it's just having that understanding of embedding it across the curriculum so students are aware across all of their years preclinical and clinical learning and there is limited time to cover a breadth of issues so eight weeks was uh, quite a challenge to squeeze it in you're almost like covering the whole of climate science in week one you're covering adaptation over week two and three but I think the purpose of the course was to give them an overview and pique their interest because I think everyone's aware in, in our generation that this is like the threat, this is the priority, and this is a maximum urgency to deal with. I think it was the most important thing was kind of getting them to be involved and interested enough so that they continue to participate in this field going forwards. And uh, also, uh, I'm sure the rest of you sort of uh, might be on the same wavelength, but it's also simultaneous learning and training from our perspective as educators as well. So it's so rapidly evolving that there's, there has to be a, a constant refreshing of our knowledge and information and keeping on top of the data as well as we're teaching. So that was one of the challenges as well from, a, from an educator's perspective, if I'm completely honest. Other in initiatives that we're having, so across the medical school, uh, we're now embedding uh, or attempting to embed climate and sustainability across modules. We also have the planetary health report card team, UCL um, came second in the country um, in, you know, for their efforts in trying to include climate and sustainability across their medical education. And they've even set up a steering group amongst the students for the report cards. And they're trying to set up a group for the, uh, to, you know, to liaise with the uh, global consortium as well for further education processes. So there's a lot going on. Scope for further work. Well, I think we've heard uh, the next step uh, from Ruth and Purnia, which is cross collaboration from different countries and different institutions as well. So pre-recorded seminars would offer um, something slightly more uh, convenient uh, in terms of students accessing materials asynchronously. And I think also for the speaker's perspective, we're going to need more and more talks from expert speakers to a enthuse, but also inform. And I think the easier option is to have them pre-recorded so speakers aren't having to speak to individual institutions uh, again and again. Some sort of textbook or a more homogenous teaching resource. We had all the medical schools in the UK uh, and the faculty get together a week or two ago. And there's various textbooks on environmental health, um, which I think uh, Cambridge Education have published one in the last year or two. Um, but there's not a homogenous curriculum across the UK to say this is what you need to know for your medical schools. And obviously, um, that, can, that has to be country specific because each country is facing different, a multitude of different issues uh, for their healthcare professional. Training, this I found would have been the most useful. I mean, I graduated um, quite recently, 2019, um, but having access to understanding how to um, utilize and find data and analyze the climate data as well, I think it felt very, um, the medical students felt out of their depth at first when they were looking at the, a lot of trying to connect the dots between um, data and forming conclusions from that as well. And 
I think developing courses on the supply chain and logistical aspects of things. This is this is the part which I think the majority of medical students will have to deal with in their careers because most of them will go into clinical practice down the line and actually very few of them have any understanding of how the supply chain works and where they can where they can be useful in terms of sustainable practice in their clinical careers. So the NHS report and then um, the net zero plans found that it's scope three, which is the supply chain and the patient transport to and from hospitals and those sorts of um, uh, sort of emissions from those that form the bulk of the NHS carbon emissions. So for doctors and healthcare professionals to have an understanding of how they can be involved in those discussions and not just sort of executives in, in hospital running is quite important. So yes, so it was probably quite a lot crammed in there, similar to the course I ran at UCL. So um, apologies if that was a lot thrown in into one, but thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions with the others afterwards as well. Thank you so much. I am just so inspired to hear about all this, all this work that's been going on. And it's, it's just really, really exciting to hear about. Um, so we would welcome any questions from people on the webinar today. You can raise your hand or just unmute yourself. So I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, good morning um, from the US, I guess. Um, my name is Alman Zarbel. I'm the director of the Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences Institute at Rutgers University. And I'm also the chair of the Department of Environmental, Occupational Health and Justice at, at the, in our School of Public Health. Um, but first of all, I'd like to uh, commend all the speakers for uh, um, good talks and amazing uh, things that you're accomplishing. Um, so I have uh, you know, a number of, of uh, uh, questions. So to uh, uh, Pornima and Ruth, um, have you, uh, I mean, this is you, what you talked to us today uh, was focused on um, working with educators to, to disseminate the message. To what extent do you also do community engagement? Do you take this down to communities that are affected? Uh, I know it's not the same type of teaching, but uh, do your, does Purima, for example, does your uh, public health institute um, uh, try to engage communities and, uh, who are, and, and educate them about the problems which they're often not aware of? Well, uh, the, the short answer is no. Actually, so far, uh, the climate change and health education has targeted health actors. So doctors, nurses, medical nursing students, um, and you know, the entire health fraternity, as it were. But, but I guess we indirectly kind of also are impacting communities in the sense that we are talking about building um, awareness among the healthcare professionals to become anchors for the communities that they serve, you know, mm -hmm. whether in terms of you know being the first responders in terms of acute climate events, but also helping communities prepare themselves uh, for climate action. So I guess uh, that's something that we advocate for a lot. Uh, we make uh, them like you know the environmental ambassadors, as it were, you know, be there as the anchor for the communities that you serve. I that answered your question, but there's no direct engagement so far with the communities. Oh, it's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> it is challenging. For example, for air pollution, we 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 have a, a program where we have put up. You know, there's lots lots of parts of the country in India that don't have air quality monitors. You know, for instance. So what we have done is we started a hospital air quality monitoring program. We put up air quality monitors in the hospitals, and we have the televisions in the waiting rooms of the hospitals showing the air quality data for the region. We also have some IEC material on air pollution and its impacts on health. So that is a direct engagement with the communities that are accessing the, these um, healthcare facilities and building their awareness on air pollution and health impacts. Going forwards, we're hoping to do that similarly for climate change and impacts on health. And, and you know, I was, for, to both of you, I was very impressed by uh, what you put together as a, in terms of you know, asynchronous uh, uh, international courses. Uh, I think that's wonderful. Uh, you know, all universities are looking more uh, towards doing, uh, uh, accessing, um, you know, other communities um, uh, in, in an online way. So I'd like to hear more about the platform. Uh, maybe we can do it offline later. Um, but I also want to just tell you briefly about, um, you know, our university has, um, we use our MPH students kind of um, as a way to, to reach out. And so we've actually set up uh, summer courses. So we have two week summer courses. Um, and so far we're in, we're in Greece working with migrants. We're uh, working in, in China and Africa. Um, and what we do is we have our, um, we offer two week courses on different topics, be it uh, migrant health or uh, nutrition, whatever, whatever the topic happens to be that we decide for that year. 
And we work with local universities and actually set up these courses. Um, and our, so let's say we send over 20 of our students and they work with 20 of their MPH students. Um, and and you know, they, they, they both get credit for the course. And it's a nice way of, of sharing information and you know, reaching out to com uh, local communities. So is that something that you, you think about or is it just, are you just hoping to continue with the online? We haven't thought about it for the co our course. That's an interesting idea that uh, I did percolate. That's really interesting. Um, I, I'm nursing faculty, so we have students out in community, and I'm I'm a public health nursing faculty. So so we have students out in the community often doing projects, and and if they have me as faculty, they're doing something with air quality or something environmental health. And then also, you know, as faculty, we all wear many different hats. Um, and so I'm, I'm the director, the co-director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment, which is a pediatric environmental health specialty unit. And so uh, last night I was working with um, healthcare providers talking about indoor air quality for their, um, not healthcare providers, excuse me, child care providers. So indoor air quality for child care. And I, I put in the climate change piece of the impact on indoor air quality related to climate change. So. Um, you know, but I, I like that idea. I need to let that percolate a little bit and how that might work. Yeah, we can talk offline. I think that I think there, I'm excited about what you're doing, and maybe there's some opportunities for us to work together as well. Um, yeah, and just, you're right just down the road. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, have, I also have a, co a comment, a question uh, for uh, uh, Adesh. Um, so um, congratulations on being able to cram something into the medical school. Uh, we've actually, you know, up until 10 years ago, we taught environmental occupational health to our medical students. And when they redid the curriculum, um, it, it's basically gone. We barely teach evidence-based medicine. So uh, kudos. So uh, how did you convince them? And what, what did you have to take out? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, there's been a sort of a gradual, uh, I won't probably delve into specific <laughs> modules, but I think there's been a gradual sort of um, uh, s sort of reshuffling of, of some of the clinical placements as well, and how long they uh, students spend on a certain numbers of, uh, how many weeks students spend on certain topics as well. Um, but I think the easier way, uh, the thing that we're finding uh, easier is to add it on in terms of vertically because it doesn't necessarily detract or take away from any of the the preclinical medicine undergraduate medicine they learn about but it's it's simple sort of um uh, things that can be embedded into the learning outcomes that allow the students to just have the awareness of it so it may not be mm -hmm. the, that the students participate in the standalone modules but they just have that understanding there is link from a to b which i think is first step to to having some sort of awareness on it yeah, of course, the limitation of that is you have to have faculty who are teaching that actually have an interest and knowledge. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Adish, I'm working on, I call them two pagers that are um, for each nursing course. So, you know, we have adult health, we have uh, pediatrics. So each nursing course, it is learning objectives. Uh, oh, there's like a paragraph of how climate change impacts that population. Learning objectives some teaching strategies and then links to things. And so we hope to do all kind of the, the standard nursing curricula. And so then you can give it to the faculty member and go, there you go. You, you know what I mean? It's two pages, you can do this. So it's how to incorporate it in, you know, you know, cause you're right. We all have a lot to, to keep up with. So I'll share it when it's done. That's, <laughs> just that sounds fantastic. <laughs> That's wonderful. That sounds yeah. Sorry. Any any other any other questions? I had a question for um, Ruth and Purnima. Um, so, uh, kind of giving a little bit of my background, um, a, a doctor. I'm, I'm a doctoral level faculty, and so we're looking to um, kind of build and develop the climate change and um, uh, overall environmental health piece in in our university. So my question is, you know. Um, you 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 said that you leverage um, social media, um, and 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 teaching the course. I know there are challenges in in social media in terms of you know who can post and um, and things like that. How do you make sure that you know it doesn't become turn into kind of a discussion where there's a you know a lot of controversial sides? Um, and then the second part of that within your courses, you know, because there are so many sides, you know, controversial sides, how do you kind of resolve conflict? Have you seen conflicts and how do you resolve that? 
Well, the, the, so it's a social media-like platform. Am I allowed to say the platform that we use? Yes, that you can. <laughs> um, we use, it's called Yellow Dig. So it is a learning tool. So it is, it's designed for learning, but it is really designed for discussions. It's not like the typical Canvas or Blackboard. Or, so, so it's social media-like. So that's one thing. So it, it you know, we, that's, a, you know, we have kind of limitation. But as far as the conflict, this, this course is the students self-select, right? This is, I, and I think it's the same. It's not a required course. So you've got students who are interested in the topic. Um, and, and we have seen, and Pornima, you can, um, you know, add whatever, but I, we, we've seen students being very respectful of one another, um, you know, and we're, again, talking about cultural differences, you know, for some of the students, English is not their first language, it's taught in English. And so, the, so they, they have been very respectful of maybe different ways of thinking and, and engaging in learning from each other is what I've observed. And Pornima, I don't know if you've seen anything different. Um, no, you're right, Ruth. I, and and uh, I, I think thanks for the question. You know, it, like Ruth mentioned, this platform was similar to a social media platform. Like, you know, it allows you to upload your lectures and you can start discussion threads. And we divided the students into groups. So within their groups, they were able to post comments, share resources, upload other uh, materials, videos, whatever it took. And it functioned a lot like a social media platform, but it was a closed group. It's a closed learning group where we had 40 odd students. And I don't think we faced a conflict situation. Ruth is right. There was a confluence of cultures as well. And I think it was really interesting that you know we had students from India, from the US, Finland, Nigeria, who were working together. They put together their group presentations at the end of the day. At the end of the course, they, there were four groups who had to work together and then come and present it to us, the faculty at the end of their course. So I think there was a lot of cross learning. So somebody from the US was sharing policy perspectives from the US and there was somebody from India sharing their perspectives from India. So I think there was a lot more that they learned beyond what they heard from the faculty's PowerPoint presentations. But the way it worked was we uploaded every week, there was one faculty member in charge. We uploaded the presentation on Sunday night and about middle of the week, we went online to see what's happening. And there was a lot of discussion already over there and very respectful of people's opinions and saying, hey, I, I like your, uh, you know, input there and your insights. So I think it was, it was fun all the way. <laughs> I think we enjoyed it as much as the students did. Yeah. It's always, I, I want to say that it's always a very good sign when students by Wednesday already are um, excited and posting because uh, in, in, you know, in the later weeks and as, as a professor, uh, students don't start posting until like Thursday. So, so that means there's a lot of interest. Yeah, they started on Monday, actually. We we said we would go on Wednesday, but sometimes I would go there to see what's happening. And they were already posting yeah. on Monday or Tuesday. Yeah, but we started in track the week. Yeah. Was the platform was called Yellow Dig. <laughs> interesting. Yes, Yellow uh, and Dig. Is it um, is it is it um, open, uh, open to anybody or do you pay a fee? How does it work? I think I think you do pay a fee. I think uh, Villanova pays for it, but somehow um, we got a deal with them that um, we they would allow it allow us to do this. So um, okay. I don't know if that's standard. I don't know. I, I just I let IT worry about that. Not a big issue. I was just I was just curious. Yeah. <laughs> I will check it out. <laughs> but it, but you can with Yellow Dig we're able to pass those boundaries of you know the different yeah. firewalls within the university. Interesting. Okay, well, thank you all so much for joining us today. And Adash, Purnima, Ruth, thank you for sharing all this really, really inspiring work that you're doing. I mean, it's just it's just incredible to see. And um, for those of you who are watching, um, you know, uh, please feel free to reach out. And I really welcome all these collaborations. And um, please feel free to reach out to me, and I can try to help you collaborate if you're if you're hoping to. So. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful day and we will see you next time. So take care. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye.